Hello everyone, Mitch Albers here. In this biocast, we're going to take a look at the specifics of the uh, process of glycolysis, the first phase of cellular respiration. The, uh, the name glycolysis tells us exactly what we're going to be doing. Glyco is the word root that refers to glucose. That's our six carbon sugar. And uh, we're going to split our six carbon sugar into two three carbon sugars. And that's what the lysis is telling us, the lysis referring to splitting. And uh, along the way, we're going to spend a little energy. We're going to produce even a little bit more energy. And then we're going to transfer some of that energy to one of those electron carrying molecules that we talked about earlier. So let's take another view of, of how we can uh, conceptualize what's happening during glycolysis. We can uh, divide glycolysis into two phases. The uh, first half of glycolysis can be referred to as the energy investment phase. And here we're, we're making uh, an actual investment of energy. We're going to actually be inputting some energy into the process initially. And the reason for that is that glucose is a very stable molecule. And it just doesn't spontaneously begin cellular uh, respiration or glycolysis for that matter. And so uh, in these initial steps of glycolysis, we're going to need to destabilize the glucose get it more reactive and get it going down this uh, glycolytic pathway. And so we're going to spend a little energy up at the front, and that's our energy investment phase. And then later on, we're going to produce some energy. So there's going to be an output of ATP energy. And, and just if we look at the numbers here, if we invested two ATPs in the beginning and we output four, we can see then we have a net gain of two ATPs. From the process, okay, and uh, and so we've actually earned two additional ATPs on our initial investment, and you know that we can use that analogy of you know if ATP is the energy currency of the cell, well, uh, just like we would do is with our monetary currency, uh, the dollar. Um, if you're if you're going to invest money in uh, your retirement account or the stock market, uh, you have to take part of your income either set it aside and put it into your retirement account uh, or if you're going to play the stock market you're going to buy a stock and uh, your hope is that it's going to gain value or your retirement account is going to earn interest over time and you're going to gain money off your initial investments. Well the same thing can be applied here in terms of our energy investment is we're going to spend a little bit of energy up front but we're hoping for a, a, a bigger gain and we're, we, we see a small gain here in glycolysis, but later on, there's even going to be a greater payoff when we get to uh, electron transport. So, uh, you know, that's what we're looking at here. In addition, we're also uh, going to be uh, transferring some of that energy from the gluco original glucose molecule to our electron carrier. NAD plus is going to come in and come out as our reduced form of our electron carrier, which is NADH. And uh, that's going to take those highly uh, uh, charged um, high energy electrons uh, that are going to be stripped, oxidized from the glucose molecule and are going to transfer them to the electron transport system. And, uh, and that's going to be for even a greater payoff in ATP energy later on. So uh, we inputted uh, glucose, we inputted uh, some ATP at the beginning, uh, we input some of our oxidized electron carrier and we, we get out uh, two of our three carbon pyruvic acid molecules, we, uh, we netted uh, two ATPs and uh, we've reduced two NAD pluses to NADHs which again they're going to go off to uh, the electron transport system uh, later on. So uh, we've made a, a, a little bit of gain in our initial investment and, uh, and as we proceed further in our discussions here we'll see even a greater gain uh, in that investment later on. Okay, so let's start getting into the, the details. We're going to go through glycolysis step by step. So if, if we could kind of take a big picture here what we're getting ourselves into is first of all uh, glycolysis uh, the glycolytic pathway is uh, actually made up of 10 reactions, okay? 
And um, as I mentioned uh, in the previous uh, discussion, we can divide uh, glycolysis into the energy investment phase and the energy payoff phase. But uh, so let's, uh, first of all, let's just say, you know, we're, we're looking at a metabolic pathway here. Okay, so um, in there are in each reaction there is a specific enzyme. So this is our E. Enzymes act on their substrates. So this is our substrate. Okay, and then they are going to produce our product. And um, and so it, with each reaction, you'll see that there is a specific enzyme involved that's going to act on the substrate and uh, each enzyme is specific for the substrate that it acts on and um, and we will move down the path okay until we get to our final end product which are our two uh, three carbon pyruvic acid molecules again we're, we're starting off with a six carbon glucose molecule uh, we're gonna split it in half when we get to this point uh, and uh, and the other thing is is that uh, we're going to input energy in this first half and output energy in the second half for the energy payoff phase. Okay, and then uh, we also are going to have uh, reduce our electron carrier to NADH, which will then take those electrons off to the electron transport system for even a further payoff. Okay, so again, uh, we'll conceptualize this as the first half. We're going to input energy. We talked about that. We're going to get to um, the midpoint here where we're going to, uh, there's going to be a, a cleavage where we're going to go from a six carbon sugar to two, three carbon sugars. Okay. So we have one, two, three carbon sugar here. At this step, uh, we'll end up with two of these glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates, or what we sometimes call abbreviate as G3P. Uh, well, anyhow, when we, we, we continue on through the process, okay, since there's two of them, we're going to follow what happens with one, and then we're just going to assume that the same thing is happening to, to the other and there will be a two in front of everything so that just means that this reaction is happening double time everything's going to have a two in front of it rather than having two two pathways going side by side we'll follow one path and just say everything you see here is happening uh, double time then when we're all said and done uh, again we're going to go through that energy uh, payoff phase, we're going to get a, a production in ATP energy and a net gain of two ATPs. We spent two in the energy investment phase. We get two ATPs out here. That's kind of where we're at our uh, break-even point. We're, uh, we spent two, now we've produced two, but then at the very last step, we, we get a net gain of two ATPs overall in our uh, energy investment. And now we end up with uh, two uh, of our three carbon pyruvates and uh, they then will go off to pyruvate oxidation. And then after that, the Krebs cycle. All right, so let's let's go through this step by step. So again, um, glycolysis is the metabolic process that serves as the foundation for both um, aerobic and anaerobic cellular respiration. And in a, in a few minutes, we'll talk about uh, what's the difference between aerobic and anaerobic. But it, it has to deal with whether there's oxygen present or not. Well, the, the thing about glycolysis is that uh, out in the cytoplasm, it's a very low oxygen environment, and glycolysis doesn't involve oxygen, uh, and, and so it's really considered an anaerobic process. Uh, 
And uh, but however, later on when we're done with glycolysis, uh, then uh, we, a decision has to be made if there's oxygen present, whether it continues through the aerobic pathway or if oxygen is absent and proceeding down an anaerobic pathway. And we'll get to those details in just a moment. Okay, so here in the first step, um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start with our six carbon glucose molecule, okay? And, uh, and here the glucose sugar is going to be phosphorylated. And phosphorylation is the uh, process where we add a phosphate group to a molecule derived from ATP. And as a result, at this point in glycolysis, one molecule of ATP has been consumed. This phosphorylation of glucose makes the glucose more unstable and reactive. Okay, so ATP is going to come in, and with the help of hexokinase, this enzyme is going to donate the third phosphate group from the ATP, and it's going to then bind to the sugar. And specifically, it's going to bind off carbon-6. So this is carbon-1, carbon-2, carbon-3, carbon-4, carbon-5, and this is carbon-6. So the phosphate is, is bound to carbon-6, and that's why we call this six, glucose 6-phosphate. Six so the 6-phosphate is telling us that the phosphate is bound to carbon-6. We abbreviate glucose 6-phosphate as G6P, glucose 6-phosphate. And, uh, and so this is a phosphorylation. And whenever we see a kinase enzyme involved, it usually involves a phosphorylation, where we're going to see a, a phosphate being added to uh, a, a molecule. And, uh, and, and again, what this does is it destabilizes our glucose molecule and uh, is getting it more reactive. In uh, the second step, step two, now we have our glucose 6-phosphate. Okay, and uh, we're going to convert it to a molecule called fructose 6-phosphate. It's abbreviated F6P. This reaction occurs with the help of the enzyme phosphoglucoisomerase. This is an isomerizing reaction. And uh, basically what the uh, enzyme does is it just does a rearrangement of the sugar molecule uh, converting it to a, from a glucose molecule into a fructose sugar. In step three, fructose 6-phosphate is converted to a molecule of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Okay, the enzyme phosphofructokinase okay, is involved, and again, this is a kinase enzyme. So we're going to see a second phosphorylation. We're going to further destabilize the sugar and make it more reactive. And now we've going to, we're going to donate a phosphate onto carbon-1. And so our new substrate intermediate is called 1,6, fructose 1,6 bisphosphate, or FBP, fructose bisphosphate. Okay. And now we're all set for uh, reaction four. And in the fourth reaction, our fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is going to encounter the enzyme aldolase. And what al the, the role of aldolase is, is what it's going to do is it's going to cleave our six-carbon sugar into two three-carbon sugars. It's basically almost cutting the sugar in half. And uh, we end up with two sugars, which are three-carbon, one is called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or G3P, and the other is a molecule, a 3-carbon sugar, called dihydroxyacetone phosphate, sometimes referred to as DHAP. Now, both glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate are isomers of each other. And in the fifth reaction, what happens is, 
is we're going to convert the DHAP into a second G3P. Or we're going to end up with two glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate molecules produced at the end of step 5. Now when we get to um, the rest of the part of glycolysis, we're, we're done with our energy investment phase. We've inputted energy. We've got the process of glycolysis rolling. And now what we're going to do is we're going to follow one of these uh, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphates, but everything that happens to it will be happening in double time because there's really two of these molecules produced at this step. So when we go to step six, the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is going to encounter the enzyme triose phosphate dehydrogenase. Okay, and so when we, whenever we see an enzyme dehydrogenase, okay, this, remo this refers to the removal of a hydrogen. And that's exactly what we're going to see happening here is our electron carrier NAD+, plus, okay, remember this is its oxidized state, is going to come in and pick up two hydrogens and, and, and get reduced to NADH. And we now know that those, the fate of those two NADHs is to go off to the electron transport system later on. Okay, then uh, what happens here is, is a free inorganic phosphate comes in, so it's going to pull this uh, phosphate out of the... Uh, cytosol, uh, which is just kind of free-floating out in the cytoplasm. And uh, we then end up with a new product, which is called 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, or 1,3-BPG. Okay, so we're still, we still have our original three-carbon uh, you know, molecule here, and there's two of them. And so all of the original carbons are still accounted for. But now we've got a phosphate bound to carbon-1, and carbon-3. In the seventh step, phosphoglycerokinase is, uh, this is a, so it's a kinase enzyme involved, but now rather than ATP coming in, ATP is going to be produced. So we're going to take one of those phosphates from the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate molecule and donate it onto ADP and produce an ATP molecule. So the, the, the phosphate here off of carbon-1 is going to get donated to ADP for the production of ATP. Remember, everything's happening double time here, so that's why there's a 2 in front of everything. But for each 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, one phosphate gets donated, but because there's two of them, there will be two phosphates donated total. That will end up in the production of two ATPs at this step. Now remember, we, we, spent, we spent two ATPs during the first half, the, the energy investment phase. Now we've gained two ATPs, so we're, we're, we're net zero in terms of energy production at this point. We're at the break-even break even point for energy production here at step seven. Okay, so now we're left with a, a new intermediate which is called 3-phosphoglycerate. This again, the phosphate is bound to carbon three. So let's talk a little bit about how we just produced that ATP molecule. Okay, so if you, if you go back, Phosphoglycerokinase was the enzyme involved, or phosphoglycerokinase, and um, it was acting on the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate molecule. Okay, so I'm missing an E here. It caused bond strain, the enzyme did, to release that phosphate off of carbon-1 to donate it to ADP so we could produce our ATP molecule. Okay? And, and so where did the phosphate come from? Well, it didn't come from the enzyme. It came from the substrate. And the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is our substrate molecule at step 7. So 
we call this substrate level phosphorylation. Okay, so in this example, this is our substrate molecule. Okay, this is our enzyme. And uh, we're going to then, the, the enzyme is going to weaken this bond between the phosphate and the substrate and allow the phosphorylation of the phosphate from the substrate onto ADP for the production of ATP. Notice the enzyme doesn't get in, uh, used up in the reaction. We, we end up with a new product, and uh, that enzyme then can be used over and over for that same reaction. So it, it helps the cell. It doesn't, the cell doesn't have to remanufacture those enzymes for that particular process. When we're all said and done, when we, we look at the overall energy production, we're going to see that there's two ways that ATP gets produced during cell respiration. This way, through substrate level phosphorylation, and then when we get to the electron transport chain, it's going to be referred to as oxidative phosphorylation. And that's a, a little bit different process, and we'll, we'll detail that when we get to that point. All right, so now let's go back to uh, glycolysis. Now we're at step eight. So we, we, we were left with the, the, the end substrate intermediate called 3-phosphoglycerate. Okay, so the phosphate's bound to carbon-3. In step 8, the enzyme phosphoglyceromutase, okay, what it does is it breaks the bond of, phosphate, of the phosphate onto carbon-3, and it's going to transfer that phosphate over to carbon-2. Okay? And that what we see happening here. And uh, in organic chemistry, we would call this a phosphoryl shift. And then we end up with a new intermediate, which is called 2-phosphoglycerate. Now our phosphate is bound to carbon 2 in our 3-carbon molecule. In step 9, our 2-phosphoglycerate encounters the enzyme enolase. Enolase acts on our 2-phosphoglycerate, and uh, what it does is it uh, releases a couple of hydrogens and oxygen for the production of water. And uh, by stripping a couple of hydrogen and oxygen, we're left with a new substrate intermediate, which is called phosphophenopyruvate, or PEP. And then in the last step, our PEP, or phosphenylpyruvate, uh, encounters the enzyme pyruvate kinase. And again, we're involving a kinase enzyme. And there, that's always going to involve a phosphorylation. And we're going to break the bond that's holding that phosphate onto carbon-2, and we're going to donate that to ADP for the production of ATP. And once we remove that phosphate, then we're left with a 3-carbon sugar, which is called pyruvate. And again, there will be two of those when we're all said and done. Okay. So again, what, what did we produce here? Well, we produced two 3-carbon pyruvates. We produced two NADHs. And uh, we produced uh, a net of two ATPs. We spent two at the beginning. We produced four, but we netted two ATPs at the end of glycolysis. Okay, now the fate of these pyruvates is to keep going down the pathway. Now the question will be oxygen, okay? Whether it's uh, present or absent will determine the, the, the pathway that we're going to take next. So let's just kind of um, recap here, you know, what we're doing with glycogen. Uh, with uh, cell respiration is we're, we're transferring energy from our original glucose to ATP so that ATP can be used to do work, like building proteins.
overall, um, what we've, we've seen so far, um, glycolysis, uh, the first part of uh, cell respiration, um, was a exergonic process. We input a little bit of energy endergonically at the beginning, but there was a bigger energy loss in the second half of glycolysis, and, uh, and so uh, it's an exergonic process. We can look at this in terms of energy yield more specifically if we, if we look at it this way. Okay, so this is kind of an energy profile, what happens during cellular respiration. And uh, from this diagram, what we can see here is, is during the, this whole yellow area is, is glycolysis. Okay, and then uh, the green, light green area is going to be pyruvate oxidation. The blue area is going to be the Krebs cycle or uh, the citric acid cycle, which is sometimes referred to. But uh, here in glycolysis, we can see when we started with glucose, we, we, we input some ATP energy. So in, in, in essence that, you know, if we looked at our free energy situation, you know, our, our delta G initially at here is, is some positive value greater than zero. Now, we're not really quantifying that. I don't have any values here, but, but we gained energy. You can see it, it, it's increased, okay? But then when we, when we split that six carbon sugar into two, three carbon sugars, then we transferred a whole bunch of that energy to our electron carriers, our NADHs, okay? And they are gonna go off to uh, the electron transport system, uh, the last phase. And then we also transferred energy to, to ATPs, okay? So we see that there's a huge drop. So now when we get to the end of the 10th reaction, when we get to our end product of glycolysis, uh, we've lost a lot of free energy. So overall, glycolysis, it's kind of that downhill that our overall delta G is going to be some value less than zero. It's going to be some negative value. We're not, I haven't quantified that, but, but uh, it's, and, and remember, that means that this is an overall exergonic process. Okay? And as you can see, when we finish off cellular respiration, that overall cellular respiration is an exergonic process. And we'll probably come back to this diagram as we get into those discussions later on. Okay, now we're going to look at what happens with uh, the pyruvate when oxygen is absent. This is the anaerobic pathway for cellular respiration that we call fermentation. Now, there's two options here, depending on the type of cell that will uh, undergo fermentation. First of all, some of the first cells that evolved, evolved the process of glycolysis and fermentation. For some bacteria and simple cells like uh, single cells like yeast cells that have very low energy requirements, they uh, evolved the process uh, of glycolysis for their energy needs. And... Um, and so the aerobic pathway that occurs like in plant and animal cells and uh, that require oxygen evolved later because the cells became much more complex, their energy needs were greater, and so uh, the also was that the Earth's environment was changing where uh, oxygen, which wasn't as abundant early on, became much more abundant with the advent of photosynthetic organisms and uh, the changing of the uh, amount of ox atmospheric oxygen that made oxygen much more readily available and, and, and that uh, allowed for aerobic cellular respiration to really take off uh, from, uh, you know, in its evolution. But uh, so here we're looking at what happens in the absence of oxygen. What, what, what do we get? Well, regardless of what we're looking at here, we, when, when things go anaerobic, we will go through glycolysis, and we're going to produce two ATPs, okay? So if, for example, uh, the type of uh, anaerobic situation is, um, let's say, in yeast cells, and, and uh, where uh, there's no oxygen present, they go through glycolysis, and we end up producing our two three-carbon pyruvate molecules. And um, what happens here when we get to the end point of, 
glycolysis, we're going to strip off carbon dioxide at this step. And by removing one of the carbons, we now are down to a two carbon molecule called acetyl aldehyde. Okay, that two carbon acetyl aldehyde then um, gets converted to ethanol. And the way that that happens is, is it's going to donate a couple of hydrogens, um, excuse me, it's going to get uh, gain a couple of hydrogens from the two NADHs that were produced during glycolysis. Okay, and uh, the addition of those two hydrogens converts the two carbon acetyl aldehyde to the two carbon model molecule called ethanol, ethyl alcohol. Okay. The, uh, the same type of alcohol that's in uh, wines and beers. And, uh, and so the alcoholic fermentation pathway is the pathway that we use for the, uh, the baking and brewing industries. Microbrewing, uh, distilleries, and uh, brewing of beers is, uh, is a big thing right now. And uh, they are maximizing uh, everything they can to get out of the, this fermentation process. And essentially what they do is they use the six carbon glucose sugar and then they use uh, yeast which metabolize the glucose and convert it to pyruvate. And, um, and they get energy out of that. And, and yeast have very small en uh, energy requirements. So the two ATPs that they get out of glycolysis is just the, the sufficient amount of ATP energy that they need for their cellular processes. And, uh, but in the process, what happens is um, when, when there's no oxygen available, the pyruvate um, gets oxidized by removing carbon dioxide, converts it to the two carbon acetyl aldehyde, which then feeds back uh, with the NADHs that are produced during glycolysis to uh, reduce the, uh, um, the acetyl aldehyde into ethanol alcohol. Okay? And um, in the baking process, you know, when, when, when the yeast are metabolizing the glucose in the dough, you know, they, they produce carbon dioxide, which causes the dough to rise. And um, you can tell the yeast are metabolizing the dough because the, door, the dough, when it rises, is warm. And it uh, also exemplifies that second law of thermodynamics, that we're converting the energy of glucose into some other form of energy. And we're losing some energy as the form of heat. Okay. And, uh, and then when you actually bake the, the, the dough, you burn off the alcohol, okay? But in the, in the brewing industry, we save the alcohol, and that goes into making up the alcohol in our beers and wines. And, and if, you're, if you're brewing wine, you, you let the CO2 escape. If you're making something like champagne, you put a lid on and you keep that carbon dioxide in the wine and carbonated wine is really champagne. So that's one of the anaerobic pathways that's available. Uh, again, depending on the cell type that we're dealing with, so things like yeast and some bacteria, they will undergo alcoholic fermentation. And then uh, in our bodies, the, the cell type that goes anaerobic is our muscle cells. Okay, and they enter what's called the lactic acid fermentation pathway. And so what happens in our muscles is that, you know, our muscle cells are metabolizing glucose and converting it to ATP. But when there's no oxygen available, it can't go down the aerobic pathway. And, and really, our muscle cells have to operate through the aerobic pathway. But in, a, in an instance where we, we, we can still get a little bit of ATP energy production, it, they can go anaerobic. And uh, so when we're working out, a lot of times we're pushing our muscle cells to go anaerobic to get them in better shape, to get our bodies in better shape, to, as athletes to become better shape. We want to go anaerobic because we're, we're pushing them to uh, basically try to be more and more efficient in getting oxygen. But when we can't get oxygen available, what happens is the, uh, the pyruvate, 
okay, gets reduced by the NADHs that come out of glycolysis, and uh, that reduces the uh, the three carbon pyruvate into what's called lactate or lactic acid. Okay, and 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 here's what happens. So so you know your muscles don't just lock up and stop working when there's you can't get oxygen to them. They can go anaerobic and they can keep working to some degree. Okay, you can run a hundred yard dash as fast as you can. At the end of that hundred yard dash, you're breathing very heavily because you're trying to deliver oxygen to those muscle cells. But you know that your muscles just can't keep going at the pace when you run a hundred yard dash they start to slow down because you're not delivering oxygen efficiently to them to keep up the work, to keep up the ATP energy demands that those muscle cells require. But then they go anaerobic and they still are able to produce a little bit of energy. And, you know, when you, when you look at the evolution of things, you know, um, predator-prey relationships, and, and it's all about survival out there. And sometimes, you know, just having a little bit of energy is just enough to escape your, your predator if you're a prey species. Uh, in our case, our muscles just don't shut down and lock up. We still can walk away at the end of a, running a 100-yard dash as fast as we can. We, you know, uh, all that laborious breathing as we've gone into a state of oxygen debt, but, you know, uh, we're still, uh, our muscle cells can take on this, this fermentation pathway and still deliver a little bit of energy to keep them going. Okay, so uh, in the event that there's not oxygen available, um, fermentation is one option, depending, again, what type of cell we're dealing with. For the rest of our discussions here in the, the upcoming video segments, we're going to continue down the aerobic pathway of cellular respiration. So thanks for watching this video, and stay tuned for my further videos on uh, pyruvate oxidation, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport system or oxidative phosphorylation.